Right, so thank you, Jung Ping. For this audience, I don't know, I may skip some of the, if you are the expert in optical tweezers, I do want to apologize, but uh, I may skip some of the optical tweezer parts and spend more time on the microreology part. As a matter of fact, so, as Jung Ping said, about 20 years ago, probably about right, there's, uh, I first learned optical tweezers from Mike Burns. I came here and worked with Greg Sonic, and then eventually there's a student, PhD student from Beijing University. We collaborate and we wrote an NSC, an NSF proposal, and we won the proposal. And then one PhD student ended up with working in my lab at Rockwell Science Center. And there's one very good student working here, Yagam Liu. I don't know anyone, know him at all. He's very good, actually. He is the one who helped me first in setting up the optical tweezer at Rockwell Science Center. Yagam Liu, I still remember, he is very nice. He's still around? Some... Oh, oh, so well, say hello to him. Anyway, uh, this is uh, some of my colleagues uh, working in this area. And as I said earlier when I was talking to Petra, I'm very lucky that we have uh, quite a few medical students start working in my lab. She just got her MD, and he'll be getting his MD next year. Right now I have six undergrad, maybe the first year, freshman medicine student, beginning working in my lab taking data. Uh, I have two second year students, I have two fourth year students, and they're very productive and, and they're really very good. They are better than, most of the time, they are the one driving my graduate student crazy. Uh, they, they work harder and move faster than my, my graduate students. Anyway, this is our annual so Chinese New Year gathering. We all always have a dinner at the Chinese New Year inviting some guests. So I think I'll try to cut short a little bit on optical trapping parts and talk more about uh, the microreology part because most of you probably familiar with the optical tweezer. This one actually, this is pioneered by Mike Burns about trapping of human films. And last two years ago, I had one student working on this subject, actually very similar to the paper published by Michael Burns uh, two years ago. We used a ring configuration and different configuration to measure the mortality, but we didn't, uh, he didn't publish it. Uh, and for those of you who haven't worked with Something's getting crazy. I didn't like it. Okay. I think it's getting slower for some reason. Anyway, uh, this is basically a, a laser tweezer trapping a human sperm. And we can track for hours uh, without any uh, obvious uh, damaging. I think the video somehow, uh, the computer is running much slower than it used to be. Okay. Just as the other extreme, like one will also show that we can trap nanoparticle as well. And this is 20 nanometer gold nanoparticle uh, in, the, in the trap. And you see, even if I move the background away, so the particle is still trapped within the, the focus spot. And what you see is the Brownian motion of the particle and which I will come back later about how we use the, the Brownian motion. And this part, I'm also sure that uh, I'll talk a little bit. We uh, did a lot of work with what I call the oscillatory optical tweezers. <clears throat> Basically, you can trap and you can oscillate the beam and then you can uh, move the particle around. <clears throat> The computer is not running right. For some reason, it's blinking. This one, I think I'll skip. And on the oscillatory, this is a human red blood cell. Normally, human red blood cell is a biconcave. In this case, we use amorphic pressure so that this looks like a, it's a bulge into a sphere. And if we trap it, and then we oscillate the beam slowly, it follows. But if you oscillate the beam very fast, the red blood cell cannot respond at first, and it see a scanning line. And when it see a line, we found out actually it got elongated, it got stretched, 
Uh, let me show you the video of this. I hope it will work out. Somehow it's not working continuously, rather it's okay. So actually I'm, I'm oscillating my beam, scanning my beam back and forth sinusoidally. And if the oscillation frequency go beyond a few hundred hertz, the regular cell see a line and then the, the sphere becomes an ellipse. So you can stretch a regular cell that way. And then one of my students came up with a very neat idea which we call jumping optical tweezer. Basically by going sending the beam through acoustic optic modulator, if you apply a sine wave, you scan the beam sinusoidally. But if you apply a square wave, actually jump discreetly between two points. Almost like this. So you generally two beams is jumping back and forth between two points. I call this a jumping optical tweezer, and I call the distance between the two spots the jumping distance. And I come back to that. So what happened a red blood cell if you use the jumping optical tweezer and jumping back and forth? Now it's in the biconcave. We didn't saw botches in the sphere. Okay? So you're jumping your beam up and down, it follows. Again, if you jump first enough, you see two spots. It's almost like a dual parallel tweezers because you're jumping so fast that it simultaneously sends the two spots and it can stretch much better than the line than sinusoidal scanning because your energy is focused on two discrete points. And you can stretch by almost 30% very easily. Okay? And we have done a lot of work with this. Let me show you the, the expanded version. What I'm doing, I'm changing the jumping distance. So I have two laser beam, one's fixed, another guy I use an AO to jump back and forth like this. And this is how the red blood cell goes stretch. And we have done a lot of uh, measuring the viscoelastic property of red blood cell using this approach, which, I will, which will be one of the main topics of our talk today. Okay. I think I can skip uh, these about uh, optical tweezer for those who here who are familiar. Basically, I hope I demonstrate that yeah, optical force can trap, manipulate, stretch small particles, including living cell. I show some data on bacteria later, and the force is typically about 100 femtonewton to 100 picoNewton for laser beam of about 10 milliwatts. It's typically in, in this range. And what's the basic mechanism? There's many theoretical models, many ways to explain. One simplest way for physicists is to use an energy concept. For example, if you have a beast in a ball, if you let it go, it drop. You said that you go to this lowest gravitational potential energy. In physics lab, if you have a dielectric material with epsilon 1 larger than the dielectric constant of the air, you connect it to a DC voltage and let it go, it will suck in. Again, that is where the electrostatic potential energy is minimum. So in optical trap, when you have a beam focus, the light intensity strongest is here. If you have N1 greater than N0, this is reflective index, the highest field area turns out to be the electromagnetic potential energy minimum. So on a similar token, it will go into the minimum position, so the particle got sucked in into the, where the, the light intensity is strongest. There are other ways to use photon momentum. When light reflected and reflected at the boundary, there's always a photon momentum change, and you can calculate the force from the photon momentum change. You can also use a Maxwell tensor to calculate the force. And in this area, I'm collaborating with Professor Yinlam Shen from Laval University. He is using COMSOL to do recently to use a finite element analysis to calculate the force distribution over all kind of soft material. And we are still collaborating and working on the theory of this using four different theoretical techniques, including ray optics model, including Maxwell tensor, and including the finite elements analysis. Yeah. 
So as you all know, so this is uh, first so basically demonstrated by Arthur Ashkin in 1970. At the time, it was a so-called dual beam. He used two beam with very mild focusing to counterbalance. What he found is that the particle got attracted transversely, but pushed away radially, axially. So he need another beam to counterbalance to try the particle three dimension. And it's really interesting that it took Arthur Ashkin 16 years until 1986 to discover that if the beam is focused strong enough, just a single beam can hold a particle without the counterbalancing, counterpropagating beam. And this eventually is known as single beam gradient force optical trap. Turns out that there's a gradient the field gradient along this direction generate a so-called gradient force which can counteract the axial radiation pressure and trap the particle in a three-dimensional position. Okay, this is just a propaganda. Uh, in 2005, uh, there's a journal called Scientists that they celebrate so-called seven key technology that transform life science research. And these are the seven selected by the journal, and optical trap is uh, on the list. So this is the earliest, in the early 90s or the late 80s, how people measure the optical force. Actually, we published one or two people with Greg Sonics in the 90s, and using this to measure the optical force by dragging. So I think I skipped the video for audience here. I will not show the video. And go back to the second approach that was, I believe, first published by Sir Professor Stelzer, M. Stelzer from Ambo in Heidelberg. Basically, what he showed is if you can trap and check the position, the Brownian motion of the particle, this is a quadrant photodiode, this signal will give you X and Y position of the particle. And by tracking the particle position, and you do a histogram, you got a very nice Gaussian distribution. Basically, most of the time, the optical trap try to pull the particle to the center. The thermal force try to push it away, but statistically, most of the time, it still stays at the center. So you get a nice Gaussian distribution. With very simple mathematics, which I will show, eventually from that Gaussian, you can get a nice parabola which is a parabolic potential corresponding to a linear force, F equal to Kx, which is a Newtonian force. So uh, in summary, the optical trend can be viewed as a linear spring, a three-dimensional linear spring. In a certain regime, within the linear regime, the force is proportional to the distance. Once you get this parabola fixed, you get a K, which is a force constant. So actually you have a Kx, Ky, and Kz. Once you calibrate all the Kx, Ky, and Kz, all you need to do is to measure the position of the particle from the center. And you multiply that by the K, then you can get force. In this way, you can measure force up to femtonewton precision. And this now become a very popular technique of measuring the the optical forces from femto newton to, to pico newton. Okay, these are the equation I was going to skip. This is how you from the Gaussian distribution, how you get the parabolic potential. It's a, a straightforward from the, the Boltzmann distribution to the Gaussian. Okay, so this technique that I just talked about, you trip a particle, check the Brownian motion, do that analysis, is uh, coined by Professor Stelzer and call it photonic force microscopy versus the atomic force microscopy, which is very, very popular. Now, this is paper, one paper that we published. Actually, this, paper, this work was done three, four years ago, but the stu student didn't write it up and eventually got delayed and until last year. This is actually the simplest concept of measuring protein protein in the action. If you are interested in measuring the interaction between the binding force between protein A and B, you just coat protein A on one base and protein B on another base. And then we trap one, and then this one is on a piezo stage, 
which you move in and then allow them to bind together and then you pull it away. As you pull it away at a certain distance, assuming the force is strong enough, then it will pull this binding apart. And then this is the breakage point. If you know the distance multiplied by the spin constant, you know the binding force. This is very simple. But actually this technique is very tedious. You have to make thousands of repeated measurements. The error bar. Tens of thousands. Very, very big. Yes, tens of thousands. The error bar is very, very big. And the major challenge is can you claim that you are measuring single molecular interaction? Which is always, that question always asked by the referee. If you have evidence that you can measure single molecule, then it's great. Otherwise, sometimes they still accept. In this paper, we did not claim that we are measuring a single molecule, but still eventually get to it. was published in the, bi the biophysics journal. Okay, so with that, now I move into the second. I'm going to apply this technique to the so-called rheology. Now, the rheology basically is study of how material deforms and flow. Okay, ideally, the physicists like to simplify things and classify material as pure elastic or ideal liquid. This will be Hooke's law. It's the law of elasticity. There's a stress proportional to strain. This is young modulus. Ideal liquid is called Newtonian liquid. It's purely viscous. Stress proportional to the rate of change of strain and the proportionality constant is the viscosity. Okay? But in reality, materials are somewhere in between. So it's a complex, it's behave in between ideal solid and liquid. And here's just a number, again I really create this, and this is Young modulus for some material in Pascal, which is a Newton per meter square. This is viscosity of some liquid in Pascal second. These are some number. Okay. As I said, Real material are not that simple. It will not be classified like this. So again, physicists like to simplify things. So they put these elastic solid and viscid, like the electrical second model. They put it in series. They put it in parallel. New kinds of things. So they have the so-called Cannon solid, Maxwell fluid, three parameter solid, three parameter fluid, and you can go on and on. Have four parameter solid, four parameter fluid. You can write the differential equation, and you can solve the differential equation on how stress and strain related to each other. And then, in the solution, if you do the Fourier transform, eventually you get a complex viscoelastic modulus. The real part is the elastic modulus. The imaginary part is a viscous modulus as a function of frequency. In other words, the material response even like a solid or liquid depends on time. And it is said that if you wait long enough, everything flow. A ball, if you drop it, it will bounce. If you sit it there, eventually it will sack. So at very slow time scale, things always behave more like liquid. At first time scale, it can behave like solid. And typical polymer, if you do that G prime and G double prime as a function of frequency, very interesting. At very low frequency, viscosity larger than elasticity. It's more like fluid. Is this region it's more like solid, and they are merely crossing over. Each region has its own physical interpretation. Sometimes it depends on the polymer configuration, the polymer entangling. There's a lot of physics and chemistry in that, that the polymer physical elastic properties. Okay, this is one example. The Maxwell, the two parameter, Maxwell liquid model, if you solve the differential equation and then do the Fourier transform, you get exact solution. And you get how G prime and G double prime looks like. Okay, this is a classical material scientist use, a conventional rheometer. This one is a high end, it costs about half a million US dollars. And this is a middle end, another uh, classical viscoreometer. You can put in liquid or solid, and then what they did is they crank it between two, and then they, they oscillate one of that, they rotate one of them, and then from there, 
give you G prime and G to the prime as a function of frequency. The only problem with this machine is the sample required for example for liquid at least a few cc, typically 2 cc to about 5 cc. And we are interested in biofluid, like synovial fluid from the patient. Typically it's always less than 1 cc. So you cannot use this to measure. That is where how microbiology come in that said I'm going to talk about. Okay. So I'm going to talk about the microbiology, which typically needs only microliter of sample to measure the viscoelastic property. And you can classify the so-called passive and active. The passive, again, is just a Brownian motion. You just follow the Brownian motion of the particle and then solve the diffusion, look at how, how it moves, and then there's a standard algorithm, which I'll talk about. So you can do the tracking with the tweezers or without the tweezers. You can do so-called video particle tracking, just a CCE camera or a CMOS to track and then do the analysis. And this can be applied even into the cell. You can do it uh, either in any liquid, in polymer, or inside the cell, or in the cell membrane. You can measure the viscoelastic properties in many different environments. Okay, and this does a standard algorithm. From the gradient motion, you get a mean square displacement, and you can get the G prime and G double prime curve out of that. This, there's another machine. Basically, it's called dynamic light scattering. It's shining a laser light. This is a commercial machine. It also gives you G prime, G double prime versus omega. The light scatter, and then there's a CCD camera capture the speckle image. And as the particles move around one motion, the speckle image change. And then on the dynamic change of the step, speckle pattern, uh, there, there's a software that allows you to calculate the G prime and G double prime. So we use this machine and also the other machine and our, the method that we develop, the so-called oscillatory optical tweezer, and we also use the laser particle tracking that I show here. And in this case, if you have the tweezer, then the Brownian motion is not the true Brownian motion because the tweezer force is there to confine. Then my student came up with another very simple, cute idea. He called it blinking optical tweezer. I like it. Basically, you just turn the beam on and off. So you take the data, collect the Brownian motion data only when the trapping beam is off for one second. And then the next again, you turn it on. Why? Because the particle will drift away. You turn it on to pull it back. And then you turn it on the next second. This allows you to extend your integration time of the, the ground motion, which is corresponding to the low frequency end of the G prime omega and G double prime omega, because that omega is the inverse reciprocal of the measurement time. So we also do that to expand our uh, frequency range. Okay. The one that we focus on mainly is the so-called oscillatory optical tracer. Basically, you trap a particle and you oscillate sinusoidally. This is a sine wave of the trapping beam, and this is the beam motion. And then there's an amplitude and a phase delay depends on how fast you oscillate. So from this amplitude of the beams, and the phase delay of the beam respect to the beam. There's an equation you can calculate G prime and G double prime. This is what we call the active or oscillatory optical tweezer techniques to measure microbiology. Okay, so this is our first test. We use agarose at different concentration, become thicker, both G prime and G double prime become higher as you use thicker and thicker agarose. Okay, and we use this equation, measure the amplitude and phase, and, and try to get that. So after this, we begin our interest in biofluid. So this is why my medical students come in handy. They start to suggest that, that the joint fluid, the synovial fluid is the first one that we focus on. So these are some of the students walking in. If you can read uh, the Chinese, 
actually I have here as uh, two first year medical student, here one second year medical student. He's a three student from Tsinghua University for physics department, and the lady uh, Jiang Jia Jun is uh, the seven year medical student. She just got her MD last month. Okay, so they all contribute to this project, and these are my PhD students. These two are my, uh, these three are my master degree students. Turns out there's different kind of arthritis with totally different origin. And typically one important marker in a clinic is the white blood cell count. Of course there are other biochemistry parameters. So the first thing we do is use a white blood cell count and see how the viscoelastic property, so this is about the synovial fluid, the role. Anyway, the main function, physiological function of synovial fluid is lubrication and buffer. Uh, shock absorption and lubrication turns out to be viscous properties. Shock absorption turns out to be elastic properties. So it's a uh, viscoelastic property. It's one of the main relevant properties of the function of uh, synovial fluid. There's also the artificial synovial fluid. When you suffer from arthritis and gut pain, this is what the standard treatment they inject the artificial survival fluid. We find three different brands with different say, polymer weight. Turns out the main component, the key component is hyaluronic acid. And the concentration and molecular weight of hyaluronic acids play a very important role in how good they are. The higher the molecular weight, the longer it lasts. After one injection, for the, before the next treatment, it may last six or eight months. With lower molecular weight, it's only two to three months. You have to come back again. Yeah, and the price also difference. Almost proportional. <laughs> and interestingly, in Taiwan, if we, if we do this, the insurance, the government pay for it. But if you do the other thing, you have to do it out of your own pocket. <laughs> anyway, but this one, you can come back every six months, then you come back every two months. So... <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so we also measure, and these actually are really, really cheap. This one is only think about 800 Taiwan dollars per shot. So these you can get for 800 dollars, you get something like 10 cc. Okay, so we use this as our standard and use a commercial reometer. We have enough volume to measure the G prime versus G double prime, and then use our oscillatory. Just go ahead. Sorry, but you know, a week after the injection. The patients who receive the different molecular weights, is it the same pain relief? <coughs> actually, the, it, it, it got, uh, because of the arthritis, actually there's some, uh, some information that destroy both the molecular weight and the concentration of these. And so it deteriorates. Right. It deteriorates but slowly. Early on, do they have the same efficacy early on? Yes. Oh, yeah. Really yeah. Yes. Yeah. They do. I, I have some data. Okay. So we use, it, as I said, the main component is hyaluronic acid. So we're also working on the hyaluronic acid uh, solution as one of our model. And again, as I said, the concentration and the molecular weight can change the polymer structure and that can affect the viscoelastic properties significantly. Okay, so the first thing we do is we invent it or we are interested in using this technique, which can measure some fluid, but this machine needs about four or five feet. So, lit, so, CC. so we use the artificial joint fluid and use these two methods to compare. And these are the general results. First, the three, sorry, this, these are the three brands with uh, three different molecular weight and the G prime and G double prime. The higher molecular weight is significantly larger. It's very interesting, only in this brand, G prime is larger than G double prime. Here, G prime is much smaller than general prime. We don't know what's the implication of that yet. So we try to understand. Anyway, we used, as I said, the commercial macro geometer and our oscillatory technique. The red one is G prime and G double prime using the commercial geometer. The T is the tweezer. The blue one is the tweezer. We can measure up to about one kilohertz. This commercial machine the upper limit is about 100 hertz. We can go to very low, almost 0.1 hertz. We can go to very low, 
if we extend our immigration time. But it takes a long time to measure. So our student got impatient, tried to get ready, and so we stopped at one hertz. Okay, otherwise you have to measure 100 seconds to get one, one set of data. And we, so all our oscillatory data, even though we can extend below here, uh, most of our students stop here. <laughs> but we can go to 1,000. But in the overlapping area, in the overlapping area, turns out to be a pretty consistent. So with that calibration, we're confident, and then we move to measure the real patient, the synovia fluid from patient. These are different patients, or osteoarthritis, rheumatic, cardiophytis. This is the white blood cell count. So the higher the white blood cell count, that means the inflammation is higher, and normally both G prime and G double prime drop. Especially gaudiotritis is the most serious. Okay, it's a different origin. And we also track one single patient. This is the same patient. Every month come back and we track the white blood cell count at different time and with the measurement of G prime and G over prime. And test out the white blood cell count for the same patient correlate very well with the, the physical elastic protein. And there's another interesting case, one patient that suffering from both gaudiotritis and osteoarthritis. And when he's suffering from both, the white blood cell counts about 10,000 and both G prime and G prime amazingly low. And then after they cure this, all we leave with osteoarthritis, now this white blood cell counts 27, is close to normal, and the G prime and G prime both came up. This is on the same patient. Okay, so this part we're still collecting. Every Friday, my student go to a hospital and collects a sample from about 10 patients from two hospitals. And we are still continue to collect and try to understand. We also try to do some biochemistry of that and to get other, some markers, other parameter and to correlate with other parameter that the hospital use. By the way, it's interesting me, the hospital also measure viscal elasticity through a micropipette and see how long it drops. It's just use a gripping. See one second how many drop grip off. And they have a number <laughs> and a number to, to to measure the viscosity of the of the fluid. That's the standard way done in the hospital. Okay. And our student actually this is the medical student, she also very interested in physics. So we have one paper on the polymer solution and try to understand the physics and chemistry. And she presented this last year in Quebec in a meeting. And she was the, the only one and the only best student of the presentation was competing with hundreds of PhD students from all over the world. She was very happy. <laughs> okay. And this is with the, the conference chair and the, the, after the after the meeting. And after that she also wrote up the whole article. The four articles did all the literature search and we end up with so publishing one paper just came out in Optic Express just yes, uh, on these topics uh, last week. In the early days, I also collaborated with Professor Daniel Ouyang, uh, Mike know him, Daniel Ouyang from Lehigh University. Actually, 30, 35 years ago, he was an undergrad student at Fujian Catholic University. I was his teacher. I was a lecturer, <laughs> and he took the mathematical physics and uh, and modern physics for me. I, I taught the two course. Anyway, after 30 years now, he become a good collaborator, and we collaborate well in working on this. So this is basically the same techniques. You can trap a particle at a membrane and oscillate and use this formula to calculate the viscous elastic property near the membrane or inside that the cell. And inside the cell, we didn't inject any particle. We just trap whatever thing we can see inside. Whatever organelle inside that you can trap and oscillate, then we can measure. Okay, so this was published in 2008. Now, we also use, use similar technique to measure the DNA protein interaction. Again, it's exactly the same trip, the same trick. This is a DNA molecule. The biology people have a lot of trick how to connect a DNA molecule to two beads. And then we fix one, and then again you oscillate the beads and measure the amplitude and phase. The only thing is at this point, we inject the protein which is known to bind 
to the DNA. As a protein binds to the DNA, its viscous elastic property change. And you can measure how the elasticity of DNA change with time. And this is the elastic constant of the DNA, 41 picomewton per micron. At this point, we inject the red A protein. And then it's increased to almost 47 picomewton per micron. And then it got saturated when the binding is almost saturated. And then at this point, we inject DI water. Turns out the binding required an enzyme. When in this stage, we also inject an enzyme, which is an ATP gamma S enzyme. It's required for the binding. When you wash the enzyme off, the protein dissociate from the DNA, and then the elastic constant drop back. So this was also published in Optics Express about uh, two years ago. And on the similar techniques, this is published in PLOS One. We trap an E. coli and do exactly the same trick. Try to measure how the E. coli interact with the surrounding. And in this particular case, we have three different kind of sample. The so-called wild type, where this little hair and tail can wiggle. And then this one is the mutant, which doesn't have a tail. But the hair is still there and can, can move around. And the third one, we kill it with UV. So they have the, the tail and also the hair, but they cannot move. And we trap each of them and oscillate. And actually, we can tell the difference, showing that this motion, that the motion is actually the largest effects. We can see the difference oscillating this, uh, these in a, in a surrounding protein environment. The most interesting is eventually uh, what we did. We knock out one membrane protein at a time of the E. coli and try to measure that. And we can detect some specific protein when it's knocked off from the E. coli. The interaction with the surrounding becomes much less. Mass less. Okay, so this is published in, in PLOS One. Now, my last topic, this is uh, one area that we did a lot, as I said, on the viscous elastic property of red blood cell. So as you know, red blood cell has to be very flexible to carry oxygen all over the, the body. And the morphology and the elasticity is closely related to the physiological function of the red blood cell. And people have used different methods to measure the earliest day, people use micropipette to suck in and to measure how soft, how deformable it is. People also have used optical and magnetic tweezer with the bees and try to oscillate near here. And also use two bees to attach as a handle and then try to pull it apart. And recently, as I shown before, we use the so-called jumping optical tweezer techniques. These are some other techniques. People have used 3 beam to bend and relax and see how it's uh, deformed. This is the, the two beams method. We also published a few along with uh, Johan Gook with two laser counter propagating. This is the earliest configuration that Ashkin came up with. Turns out if you put a red blood cell, it also got elongated in the under the, the counter propagating beam. We also done some work earlier, but recently we have been focusing on this jumping optical tweezer to legs, as I said, send the beam to a crucial optic modulator and then just scan discreetly and you get two spots and you can, can change the distance. Okay, so this is a technique. You can change the beam distance, you come back, you can measure repeatedly the elongation as a function of jumping distance. You can also measure the dynamics. You go and then you relax and see how it changes with time. So we did both. And we also did the theoretical modeling. When we shine two light beams into a red blood cell, how the, the deformation changes with the distance between the two beams. This is with uh, Professor Yinlong Shen from Laval University. And again, it was uh, published in Optics Express. And this is how the force distribution, and from there we can get the elastic constants. 
Okay, uh, Kamal Yunlong Shen published, uh, presented this last year in a council award, a council conference in Boston and also got the press paper award last year. So we supplied the uh, experiment data and Yunlong work on the theoretical model. Yeah, this is an example. The reasons are there. These are just to show the distance between the two focus spots and show how the red blood cell elongated. So this is the jumping distance, this is the elongation, and from there we can get the deformability and the average effective elastic constant of red blood cell. Recently we are more interested in, so we can also measure in terms of deformability. Uh, this is, again, last year, one of our master's degree students uh, looked at the patients, the red blood cell, uremia patient, and then before and after hemodialysis, and compared the viscoelastic properties, and we can see a, a, a big difference. So recently, we are mainly focusing on this dynamic measurement. Basically, you change it, and you measure how the length changes with time. So you can repeat the same red blood cell, you stretch, relax, stretch, and relax. You can do it many times. And then from there, you can fit to an exponential deformation curve and then an exponential relaxation curve. From this curve, now we apply to this model. Turns out that this model all give you an exponential rise and decay. So by feeding the external data, you get these parameter A and B, and then from there you get the elastic constant and viscous, viscosity of this part. And we use these, all these model, and to make the story short, turns out that this model is almost sufficient to describe the red blood cell. This doesn't do that much, because this is very big. Either one, K1, K1, either one become very big, and it's almost doing nothing because it's so stiff that it's almost like a rod. So all the rule essentially play by this K and either adding something here and here doesn't contribute almost uh, very insignificantly. Okay, so this is the general algorithm. We got the experimental data, we fit this curve, we got the A, B, and then we got these value. And then from there, actually, you can also deduce the G prime omega and G prime omega. So for every red blood cell, I have the effective elastic content, I have the deformability, I have this parameter, and I have this curve to characterize the viscoelastic properties of every individual red blood cell. And we are doing this, and then right now my student is working on this is one of another student thesis he'll be graduating this year we are writing the paper on this we add three different kinds of drug uh, the NEM is known to change the spectrum from tetramer to dimer this is one drug and the chemo is another drug that's uh, main function is to detach basically detach the cytoskeleton from the membrane and then the third one is hydrogen peroxide, which basically has destroyed the memory. So for the red blood cell, we act individually, separately, each drug, and then try to measure the viscoelastic properties and see what happened. And this is one example. The red curve at the blue, the red, the blue one is a normal before adding the drug. The red one is the red blood cell after adding the MEM. This is a statistical distribution. So this drug made the cell stiffer because the before, I'm sorry, softer. The deformability become larger. Here's also the deformability. The red one is one after adding MEM. So it become tougher, becomes, uh, becomes softer. And the other drug, interestingly, shift in the other direction, adding chemo, shift in the other direction. This is with adding the drug, this becomes stiffer. Okay, so we still analyze, we don't fully understand that the detail yet, and we still try to understand the, what's happening in there. So this is a summary, we use this, this approach, and fit this curve, and then into this model, eventually I said this one doesn't have any significant play, we also get this, 
And this is a summary of the result. This is where the normal red blood cells sit in, in the K and the eta value. And after adding MEM, this is how the value change. This is the effects of the chemo drug. This is the effects of hydrogen peroxide. How it changed the red blood cell viscoelastic property on the K and eta plane. This is a summary. And we still continue to collect these data. And actually, other people, this is a German group, also used the counter-propagating. They put in about two to three watt CW wow. to pull the white blood cell uh, or other cell and claim that they can detect the difference between the cancer cell and the normal cell. And I was told that at least 12 hospitals in Germany are doing this as a clinical trial. They claim they can measure 1,000 cells per second. I don't know how. In my lab, I can measure only one cell per second. I don't know how they claim that they can measure 1,000 cells per second. Uh, there must be some trick or something we still didn't, didn't know. Anyway, so basically, I briefly introduced optical tweezer, talking about cell rheology, micro -rheology, <coughs> and possible biomedical application that my lab is working on. I think the time is about right. Yeah, uh, I gave a lecture two years ago. This is a uh, Saratov State University in Russia celebrating 100th anniversary. So they have an optics conference. I gave a lecture there. I think this is still on the website. It's probably still alive, and you can find some of my stuff in this uh, website. And three years ago, I also was invited to give a lecture at the European Winter School of Biophotonics, eventually came out as a book in Springer Valley, and there's a one book chapter, which I talk about some of the, my earlier work. Okay, with that, I think I'll stop and entertain questions. <laughs>